Whiskey has a long and distinguished history, uh, sometimes sorted actually. Farmers have you know, a big bumper year and they can't sell everything locally. They can't store because cereals go bad in a hurry uh, and they get really nasty when they do. It can make you really sick. There's, a, there's an incentive to take that and make liquor out of it because you're essentially taking a bunch of excess product, excess crops, and you're refining it and turning it into a value-added product. Uh, you're condensing it in size, making it easier to transport, and it won't spoil. Corn-growing farmers in the southeast could take all their excess crops, distill it, you put it in barrels so it matures and it gains value over time, and you can ship it further distances. You know, you can send it up the Mississippi from Kentucky to Chicago, where it can go out on you know, rails all across the country. Whiskey was the major spirit consumed in America for, uh, for a very long time. Uh, right up until Prohibition, actually, when you know we the Volstead Act passed and we had our great experiment, which, as I'm sure you're aware, failed miserably. You see a rise in white spirits uh, because they're faster; they don't have to barrel age, so you can go quicker from you know from the still to the market, and hence bathtub gin and all those other wonderful things. But whiskey never stopped being made in Canada, and it was a bootlegger's paradise because it's the longest undefended border in the world. So you have people making you know, uh, whiskey up in Canada. Uh, Crown Royal is, the, I think, the great example. It's a higher rye uh, content because rye grows better in colder, hardier climates like Canada. You can make your rye up there. They never bothered stopping because there was a huge market. Uh, scotch took advantage of this as well. You would run scotch over to Canada and then people would fill up boats and run them down the coast and then redistribute from there. After the prohibition was struck down, Canadian whiskey had in a cachet. Rye whiskey, you know, had new fame and people started to go back to some of the classic American brands, but because bourbon takes as long as it takes to make, you know, it has to spend two years in its barrel minimum, uh, people started drinking whatever they get their hands on. Unaged spirits, moonshine, and with the opening of the Soviet Union after World War II, vodka became a much bigger thing. And you know, Vodka is now the largest selling spirit in the world, the biggest part of the alcoholic market share. Whiskey kind of spent a while being sort of what your grandfather drank. Um, but bourbon picked back up starting in the 50s, the 60s. They returned to some of the old traditional ways and they started making newer and better products. And as people started to see that, they stopped drinking so much light domestic beer. You know, there became a market for these things. Now in the last 30, 20, 15 years, there's been a big resurgence in micro distillers and artisanal distilleries in America. Both you know, because of beneficial tax breaks and legal codes, and because people are really just out there trying to make a better beverage. And they're asking themselves, you know, well, does whiskey really have to be kind of bland? Does it have to just taste like the barrel? So you see a lot of people doing newer and interesting things. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're all better for it. You know, expanded market share, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that tide smells like liquor.